So uh, as James said, uh, we have the third four, depending on who uh, ranks us, uh, largest uh, a product manufacturing company or a contract manufacturer. Uh, we build everything from healthcare products, uh, uh, like a patient monitoring system, to laundry detergent packaging. Uh, we also build a lot of smartphones and aircraft parts. Uh, we are gearing up to build uh, parts for uh, 3D printers, and we have been printing. Uh, we have been creating parts uh, uh, for traditional digital printing for many, many years. Uh, we manufacture defense and aerospace components. Uh, we manufacture a lot of products like smartphones that you usually uh, touch day in, day out. Uh, as James said, we are close to an $18 billion company ramping up to uh, higher numbers. Uh, about 200,000 people in the world, uh, 100 sites, and we are glad that nobody knows us because what we really do is we service our brands, and we service the top 250 brands in the industry, and we make sure their products reach our homes uh, and your homes, uh, and you, and, and make, so that you can make good use of that, and nobody knows uh, who manufactured them. So, uh, again, thanks for hearing me out, and that's what uh, JBuild does. Uh, we have three uh, divisions. Uh, we have uh, the main company, uh, JBuild, uh, because some of you may be familiar with uh, certain components of our business, right? And then we have uh, a division called as Nipro Healthcare uh, and Packaging, and these folks manufacture the patient monitoring systems as well as the uh, laundry detergent packaging. And we have a, a division called as Greenpoint uh, that focuses on lifestyle products, consumer products, wearables, uh, cellular phones, uh, mechanical parts for smartphones, and, and so on and so forth. And, and these are the three uh, uh, companies that you will you'll get across, which are all under, under JBL. Okay? All right. Thank you. All right. So when we, uh, when we talk about printing electronics, uh, essentially, as uh, Jennifer and Scott pointed out in the morning, uh, we are looking to... Uh, take a look at uh, a material that can come in the form of an ink or a filament, and then uh, you can deposit it, and when you deposit it, it performs the function that a traditional part that was manufactured using a mechanical process uh, used to perform. So if you know how a printed circuit board or electronic component is manufactured, uh, in, in simplistically, it is made up of multiple layers. And all these different layers are made of different functional materials like copper, like silicon, dielectric materials like epoxy, and, and so on and so forth. And all these different layers are manufactured using a set of six to seven steps. So each layer requires you to go through about six to seven steps uh, in which you are uh, uh, masking components, you are drawing them, the circuits, uh, you are etching it, you are laser drilling parts, uh, you are applying uh, adhesives, and then you are laminating two layers together. So when you go through these six, seven steps in a traditional electronic component or a PCB manufacturing process, you come down to uh, one layer. Uh, and then you have to repeat these six to seven steps uh, multiple times in order to actually get to the final uh, structure, which is a printed circuit board or an electronic component. And then subsequent to that, uh, folks like JBL have to take these components, put them on the printed circuit board, take the PCB, and then convert that into a product. So there are a lot of steps uh, you have to go through when you, when you come up with a product. The promise of printing anything, whether it's an electronic component or a non-electronic component, is that if you have a novel ink, and that novel ink can perform the function of your traditional material, like a silicon, copper, silver, nickel, then that ink can substitute that particular part and still perform that function. The beauty of 3D printing and the allure of 3D printing uh, or electronics is that now you can take these six to seven steps for each layer and reduce that to a couple of steps. You print a layer and you cure it, essentially. I, I know it's a little bit more complex than that, but I'm just trying to uh, paint a picture here why people are so fascinated about 3D printing and why there is more fascination about 3D printing of uh, electronics. Okay? Now, when you, when you print electronics, you essentially can do it in two forms. Uh, and both these forms have been uh, used for several years, and uh, they are beginning to, uh, uh, to, uh, to come together. So one form is you have a functional ink that replaces a particular functional material that you are using, and you print it on a flexible substrate. Okay? And now this printed structure on a flexible substrate performs the function that a printed circuit board or an electronic component was doing. Right? But in this form, it still needs to be integrated in the final product. And on the next slide, I'll kind of explain what the differences between uh, these processes are. 
On the other hand, when you 3D print electronics, uh, you can essentially get it into any complex form that you want, right? So you can 3D print the substrate, which is a dielectric, and you can 3D print the conductive part, which in this case happens to be an antenna. Uh, so essentially, these two different flavors are talked about when we talk about uh, printing electronics. Uh, obviously, the focus here is uh, 3D printing. Uh, so in the later part of the presentation, we'll start getting narrower and narrower and take a look at a very specific application. Uh, unlike uh, some of the presentations here, this is a very uh, uh, technical presentation with a lot of uh, uh, charts and stuff. So I, I hope uh, a lot of folks uh, can appreciate that too. All right, so when we talk about products, uh, electronics are manufactured separately. And then they are integrated into what makes a product, which is typically a plastic glass or a metal casing, right? And that's how, if you look at a washing machine, a washing machine has a control panel, but behind that control panel is actually a printed circuit board, and that printed circuit board has touch sensing uh, uh, elements on that, so that when we attach this printed circuit board to the plastic part that we see in our everyday house, uh, in, on the washing machines instead of the knobs, you can get the same touch functionality that you expect on a phone. So now you can get that functionality uh, in a washing machine. And if you go to any big box retailers, uh, you'll see a lot of washing machines uh, built that way. And I just picked that as one example of how you can uh, uh, bring uh, functionality into, into plastic parts, right? The process that is used to integrate these printed circuit boards onto these plastics uh, is you have to use six-axis robots, you have to use fixtures and tools, uh, there are manual processes involved and so on and so forth, and you put all these things together and then uh, you get a product uh, with an electronics integrated into it. Uh, the other process of integrating electronics is by directly plating on plastic. So what you could do is you could take a plastic part, say a cell phone cover, and then you can laser etch a portion of it and then plate it. And after you have plated it, you have created a trace. And then you can place components on top of that trace, uh, similarly to how uh, Dr. Lewis was uh, showing in the morning. Right? So that's another aspect, but it requires a lot of plating processes and, and, and mechanical uh, process. The third approach is to print these electronics, which is that printed circuit board there, and the touch sensors that you see. If, so you see these uh, rectangular copper traces, these are touch sensors. So you take those and you print them on a flexible substrate, like a polycarbonate or a PET substrate. And then the advantage of this particular printed electronic part over this PCB is that you, in this case, you have to take the PCB and integrate that with mechanical processes, right? With this process, you can take this flexible PCB and injection mold it directly with the plastic. And that way you can reduce a lot of uh, integration steps. Again, that's how printing of electronics can help you simplify uh, the mechanical and the assembly processes uh, that are required in order to uh, integrate electronics into products. And then, of course, we come to the holy grail, which is uh, printing of electronics. In this particular case, you don't have a substrate, right? All you really have is your 3D printed plastic part or your injection molded plastic part, and then you are printing the electronics directly on that part. So for example, in this case, it's a cell phone cover, you have an antenna, and an antenna in a traditional process will require about 15 to 20 steps to get in the stamp form, and then it is glued on an injection molded cover. Whereas with the 3D printing process, you can directly print that antenna on a 3D printed part, right? So these are the four different approaches in which products uh, are, can be manufactured uh, by integrating electronics in it. Uh, and, and as we evolve from one stage to the other, each stage has its benefits. Some processes are more mature than others. Uh, other processes are more seamless and have a lot more less mechanical steps. So basically, you have to take a look at uh, the, dif the uh, different applications and select an approach that's appropriate for your application. Uh, and, and in some cases, it might uh, help to stay uh, with the traditional integration process. And in other cases, uh, it, it might be useful to actually move on to 3D printing or, or printed electronics and so on and so forth, okay? Um, quickly, this is a 3D printing conference. You guys are knowledgeable about uh, 3D printing, but I just want to qu quickly paint the printing landscape. Uh, so when you look at 3D printing, uh, 3D printing is either used in the social engineering space where uh, you have folks uh, that create a heart tugging uh, arm for uh, a, 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 a child that doesn't have an arm, or somebody creates a throat insert and, uh, and, and saves the child. Uh, or people create uh, enterprises uh, within rural uh, areas that are enabled by the 
uh, ability to 3D print parts and, and generate employment and so on and so forth. So there is a social engineering aspect. Uh, this is the most talked about, common, uh, very understood uh, 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 aspect about uh, digital prototyping. And soon as we saw from HP's presentation this morning, we will move into uh, uh, digital manufacturing uh, or digital high molecular manufacturing in the coming years. Right? Then there is process optimization, where instead of mechanically manufacturing uh, an injection molding tool, uh, you can create uh, an injection mold insert using 3D printing and actually mold a prototype uh, through the injection molding process uh, the same with the same material that you will eventually use uh, with production. Uh, so here's where you bridge the traditional processes and the uh, evolving 3D printing processes uh, to optimize your production process. Uh, here's an example where you use 3D printing for the production of molds. Uh, in this particular case, if you need cooling channels in an injection mold, uh, they, can, uh, they, they cannot be created using uh, a traditional uh, mechanical uh, machining process. So here you use uh, basically 3D printing uh, to do that. Uh, manufacturing aids are very commonly talked about. Uh, so you can create a lot of different manufacturing aids uh, using uh, uh, 3D printing, and that help you speed up and customize the uh, manufacturing process also. Something that is also uh, recently emerging is where we are looking at uh, uh, 3D printing of electronics. However, in those particular uh, production cases, uh, those electronics or antennas are printed on uh, a surface similar to what uh, uh, Dr. Lewis showed in the morning, uh, which is on, it's an injection molded part and the antennas are 3D printed in production on the edge or the top part uh, of this 3D printed part. Right? And what we started to set about do over, over the period of the last one, one and a half years is to reverse that. And what we actually wanted to do is to print that antenna in a more complex curve, and I will explain that uh, in the uh, later, uh, ne next slide. So you can see here 3D printing is moving from this uh, digital prototyping uh, stage uh, to where actually some applications of uh, using 3D printing in production of even electronics uh, have started to emerge now. Okay? All right, so this is um, uh, what we started to set, of, uh, set to do. Uh, if we did, when we started this, we did not have an integrated equipment where both the plastic part and the electronics part could be 3D printed on the same machine. So in this particular project, uh, the samples were done back and forth going between uh, two different set of equipments. Uh, however, now we know that uh, newer equipments are emerging on the market where uh, this is uh, uh, integrated. Right. Uh, what we wanted to really do is we wanted to see if we could take uh, a 3D printed base substrate and print some functional electronics on it using 3D printing and then see if it is equal to or better than our commercially uh, manufactured part. Uh, and in doing so, we approached uh, a couple of leading universities. We approached the uh, top vendors at that time that were available for uh, uh, 3D printing uh, of electronics. And we, we gave them a challenge to uh, print the antenna structure on a doubly curved surface. And when I say a doubly curved surface, what I really mean is, I know it's difficult to appreciate that, but bear that with my mind. So when, when Dr. Lewis showed us a surface this morning, they were printing antennas on this kind of a curvature, right? What we wanted to do was we wanted to print an antenna on this side of a curvature as well as across the curvature. So now we are not looking at uh, a simple print of an antenna, but you are looking at a complex curve whereby your antenna has to traverse uh, three different axes at, at multiple times. And because at that time an integrated equipment was not available and these two processes were separate, it was a little bit more uh, uh, trickier than, uh, uh, than we thought it would be. Right? Uh, what we also encountered is not all 3D printed uh, substrates were able to take the antenna conductive ink seamlessly. So there's a lot of learning that needs to be done in the industry in order to make sure the inks can, uh, 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 the inks can adhere to the, uh, uh, to the 3D printed substrates. Uh, the second piece everybody appreciates is most of 3D printed parts have texture on it. And when you print something on a textured or a granulated surface, uh, the conductive inks flow. And as, as Bill will, will, will say, uh, antennas are sensitive. Uh, when you try to reduce the gap between the traces or you, can, you play with the uh, edge of the antenna, uh, it affects the fidelity of the antenna during communication. 
right? So it was, it was critical to find out an ink and equipment method uh, whereby uh, we could do that. The second piece that we encountered uh, was that uh, a lot of times uh, when, when the electronic uh, equipment uh, 3D printers were tried to print a conductive ink in that doubly curved corner, uh, the ink would flow and it could bridge. And a, a couple of the equipment vendors had to actually apply a dielectric material uh, in this corner before they could print uh, an antenna on, on, on top of it. Uh, so they had to go through an intermediate step before they could make their 3D printed part functional with, with electronics. And this is kind of consistent uh, with the theme where a lot of additional finishing steps are required in order to make uh, a 3D printed part uh, functional. So after going through with these iterations uh, for several months, uh, uh, we finally got a part uh, that was a complex curvature that was uh, 3D printed and that had an antenna uh, that was, uh, that was per printed in the, uh, in the corner. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to end uh, my section of the presentation and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Bill Garen, uh, who is now going to take the part we printed, a 3D printed complex part and a 3D printed antenna and uh, go through some uh, RF uh, testing on it uh, to kind of show us uh, whether the 3D printed antenna was uh, functional. And one of the things we did was we tried to uh, stay close as, as close to the uh, production processes uh, for testing. So when we test commercial parts, uh, that's what we do. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Guresh. Um, now we're going to move into a little bit more of the drier section uh, where we actually are looking at the detailed data um, that we took on the, uh, on the project. So we're looking at um, some of the materials, some of the, um, some of the structures, some of the data that we took, some of the S parameters and other RF uh, data that we took. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some, of the, some of the measurements we made, what those are and how they are important for RF, um, what we got out of the data and how closely the performance of the antenna mapped or married against the, uh, the original antenna um, that, we, that we started with. So material samples were characterized to uh, determine the dielectric constant and the loss tangent of, uh, of the materials. These tests were performed using a specialized cavity resonator uh, connected to a vector signal analyzer. They were carried out using uh, a cavity resonator along with key sites uh, vector network analyzer connected through a, through a PC. Um, typically, typically, the selected materials and dielectric constants of approximately 2.5 were seen. Values varied based on the printing parameters. The loss tangents of the materials were acceptable for our applications. We, uh, for this particular project, uh, we did not go through rigorous mechanical testing. It was purely a, uh, an electrical test of the antennas uh, as we felt that the, uh, the process, the materials, uh, and the 3D printing uh, overall process um, still needs uh, some work um, prior to actually going and taking that um, type of rigorous testing uh, on the RF side. Uh, this slide describes the materials that were selected for 3D printing of the covers. Electrical characterization was performed to determine their electrical uh, and dielectric properties. The figures show the dielectric constant and loss tangent of each material sample. The results show that the dielectric constant and loss tangent of each material sample are relatively consistent. There is only roughly a 3% difference between the dielectric constant of the commercial cover and the digital ABS printed cover. However, the loss tangent was about five times higher in this particular case due to the higher loss in the conductor of the 3D printed structure. This is just a simplified block diagram of a transceiver in a radio. So any system that you would have, whether it be Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or cellular or any of the communication um, protocols that we use, um, would have a transmitter and a receiver 
and clearly an antenna to transmit or receive in, in free space. So if we look at a, at a system, the signal goes in, whether it be data or video, um, it's up converted to a higher frequency and then transmitted through power amplifiers out the antenna for radiation. On the other side, on the received side, the data is received through the antenna, comes down through the low noise amplifiers where the signal is, is integrity is uh, kept uh, and that data is then sent through the filter down converted to baseband where processing takes place and the original uh, data or video is extracted. If you look at the number of antennas today being manufactured and being put into products, it's staggering. As an example, in the cell phone industry, there are upwards of two billion um, uh, new cell phones and smartphones being, being manufactured per year. That doesn't include all of the other wireless radios out there. So there's literally tens of billions of antennas per year being, being manufactured uh, and sold in the marketplace. As the internet, as the IoT uh, infrastructure rolls out, you can imagine the number of antennas there will be and the number of opportunities for potentially this technology to be deployed. So in general, there are a variety of antenna architectures on the market today that we in the EMS uh, industry support development and integration of. To get products to market faster, uh, EMS providers employ design expertise such as antenna matching, layout, etc. during product development. Antenna platforms include 3D printed antenna techniques, plated antennas, stamped metal and PCBA antennas, and in some cases smart or active antenna architectures. So those would contain multiple antennas, maybe diversity type technologies or other technologies phased array, et cetera. Current state-of-the-art technology for antennas and handsets is either integrated onto mobile covers or as antenna inserts. The covers are injection molded and antennas are integrated, either stamped and glued or laser etched and plated in some fashion to the surface of the back cover of the, of the handsets. They can be electronically connected to those radios or transmitters and receivers through pins when the cover is snapped in place. So here's a test fixture that screws to the phone covers that was designed and built in order to facilitate the testing of our antennas. So we have, we have a 3D printed base that we use to hold the 3D printed um, antennas and cover sets. And then we have a ground plane that we designed that mimics what would be the structure of the PCBA with all of the components and circuits on board. Um, micro the, the fixture was offset from the phone using standoffs and it utilized spring-loaded pins to make contact with the antenna pads. And the intent of standing that off was again the fact that the cover sits away from the surface of the PCBA and the associated uh, components. Microstrip lines extend from the spring-loaded pins to the SMA edge connectors on the edge of the board. The ground plane of the test fixture was the same general shape as the ground plane on the phone so that we could again best approximate the circuit, circuitry and the battery. S11, which is, I, I, I call it S11, I'm actually talking about the magnitude of S11 or the amount of energy that reflects back um, of each antenna was measured and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Commercial cover measurements in the fixture provided a baseline in our experiment for comparison with the 3D printed antennas. So just a quick slide on, on terminology. So when we made our experiments, we did our experiments, we took our antennas and the port that has a connector is what we called our test port. So when we injected signals into that port, we looked at what was reflecting back, and we sometimes refer to it as our reflection, or S11, or magnitude of S11. 
That number or that information is typically expressed in dB, which is essentially a, a mathematical multiplication of the signal, the amplitude of the signal that goes in and what reflects back. So the relative difference is the number of dB down that signal is. So the performance of the antenna um, on a flat piece of glass was modeled in HFSS. So ANSYS's high frequency simulator software for three dimensional modeling is what we use to, to model this. Shown here is the antenna S11 return loss model, including uh, a modeled signal to ground probe. So we had a signal to ground probe that we also included uh, in the design. It can be observed that a good match with model um, uh, was, was off slightly due to some parasitic effects in the probe that were hard to, uh, hard to model. From this observation, it was concluded that the fixture was absolutely required um, to provide a good simulated model to accurately predict the printed antenna performance. Now, we look at the S11 measurements made again in the fixture, but this time on the printed cover with the printed antenna, again, as Garish pointed out, on the doubly curved surface. Measurements were made from one to three gigahertz with 200 uh, kilohertz spacing between the points. For comparison, the commercial cover with commercial antennas was also measured using that same test fixture. The figure shows the S11 plots of the printed cover and the commercial cover. Note that there is a good match at 1.2 gigahertz, but that we see a 200 megahertz shift at the higher frequency of resonance. The shift is likely due to differences in the, in the printed dimensions, as we were really trying to hold very tight control on the print widths and spaces on the, on the printed um, portion of the antenna. There were differences in dielectric constant between the original uh, antenna and the printed antenna, and then the parasitic effects in the, in the, in the ability to accurately model the probe also came into effect. So there were multiple, uh, multiple areas that will need additional investigation. So radiation pattern measurements were performed on an echo in an echoic chamber on the printed cover with the printed uh, antenna. The RF test fixture was also used in the, in the pattern measurements. Shown here are both uh, the azimuth and the elevation uh, data that we took. We simulated the efficiencies of the commercial cover, a plated cover, and the 3D printed cover in the antenna. As noted during those simulations and, and looking at the data, the printed cover, printed antenna had approximately a 10% lower efficiency due to the lower conductivity values that we used when we printed uh, the 3D antennas. Finally, we took a 3D, 3D printed cover with a 3D printed antenna on the doubly curved corner again, and we actually took that, put it on a phone, and linked it with a base station. So we made, we made real uh, LTE measurements, um, and we were, during those measurements, we were roughly one mile from a base station, mid-morning, 10 a.m., uh, and so the proof uh, that we could actually design, manufacture, and assemble a phone with a 3D printed antenna and get it functional um, was proved here in this, uh, in this project. So in summary, we, we accomplished what we set out to achieve. That is to print uh, a cover with a printed antenna to take that structure, substitute it in place of a of a commercial antenna and put it on a phone, make measurements, uh, and prove that 3D printing is a viable approach. Um, taking a structure as complex as the antenna that we had and putting it on a doubly curved surface was very, very complex. It proved to be uh, very, very difficult for us. And as such, we spent um, more, much more of our time working on that portion than we did on the, on the actual antenna design and tweaking the design to queue up or line up the, uh, the resonance points in the data. Um, as we look forward, we see this technology is a very viable technology uh, for uh, many, many other applications. 
um, as we move, as I pointed out earlier, into IoT with all the various um, antennas that you're going to see there. In the medical space, as Garish commented on, um, putting antennas in, in body, as it makes sense, um, are, are many um, opportunities that we see there as well. So we found the project to be very successful and we look further into, we will look further into um, working with 3D, 3D printing of antennas. Thank you.